Hi, I'm Pete and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. It has turned nasty outside. It's windy, like around 40 miles per hour windy. It's snowy, it's rainy, it's too cold to do anything outside and my plans are kind of killed for the week. I had planned on moving the Dexters out, I had planned on finishing fixing fence, finishing spreading compost, that ain't happening. So I'm going to make this an inside video and talk about farming and labels. Quite often at market I get what I call label shoppers, which are people that just want to ask simple questions and upvote or downvote our farm based on those. Um, organic certification is always a big one, GMO free, animal welfare approved, that doesn't come up as much, and also cured meats and the use of nitrates. So I'm going to cover each of those in turn and talk about how we made sensible decisions regarding each. I'm going to do that while I clean up my shop because it's one of the few indoor things I can do on miserable days like this. I want to start with the biggest one which is are we organic? The answer is no. And there was a lot of thought behind that decision when we first started farming. The biggest aspect of our operation that is not organic is our grain. We use locally grown grain which contains GMOs, soybeans and corn and that knocks us right out of the organic category. But there are other reasons besides the cost of grain that we decided not to go organic and I'll go through those one by one. First of all, not going organic was a product of us trying to make local food affordable to the widest customer base. If we decided to go organic we'd be paying two to three times the cost of what we pay for grain now and our product prices would have to go way up. So we chose to go the conventional route. Secondly, I have a sort of traditional farming ideal which is I don't like Big Brother watching over me. I'm an adult. I can decide how to run my farm properly. I despise the idea of third party certification and here it's through NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. I don't want an inspector on my farm telling me what to do. I don't want to follow a whole bunch of what seem to me arbitrary rules just to get a piece of paper that says I'm certified. I don't like the bureaucracy of certification. I don't like the fact that I got to fill out a bunch of paperwork to show somebody I'm doing the right thing. I don't like the extra cost of it. And they have their own list of chemicals. So of course organic certification says you can't use glyphosate or Roundup on your land and I understand that. But they swap out the prohibited chemical list with a whole bunch of new chemicals that you can use. It's like pick your poison, one or the other. That doesn't make sense to me. I also feel that organic certification entails this goofy decision making process regarding the use of antibiotics and other medi medications. If I have a sick animal, I'm going to treat it with antibiotics to make it better. It's the humane thing to do. It's what I'd do for any family member. But organic certification says, well, once you do that, the animal has to leave it has to go be butchered or sold and it's not organic anymore. And I understand that the therapeutic use of antibiotics and hormones and things like that to overcome stressful living situations or to make the animal grow faster is wrong. But occasional use is just fine. It's just they don't know where to draw the line so it's all or nothing. The other thing is that we have to use coccidia stats for our poultry. Coccidia is, some, is an organism that lives in the ground pretty much everywhere and if you're running poultry on pasture they're going to get it and when they're young it can be deadly. So we give coccidia stats to our broiler birds and our turkeys to get them through the first three weeks of life without suffering too badly from that parasite and we deworm our pigs. We give them ivermectin primarily because again Pigs will grow a lot slower if they have a big parasite load and it can be deadly if it gets into their liver and lungs at a young age. So we use ivermectin sparingly and yes there are some more homeopathic routes we could do like feeding um, diatomaceous earth but holy cow I'd have to feed bags and bags and bags of diatomaceous earth to get rid of the worms that just one ivermectin shot every six months does all by itself. So Again, we're walking the line between economics, common sense, and what's right. 
Although I have a lot of problems with the organic certification rules, we do follow almost all organic practices. We don't use fossil fuel fertilizers. The only things we apply to our pasture are compost and lime to adjust pH. And we follow the low stress guidelines for raising healthy animals that are disease free. My problems with organic are mostly in the details, all the regulations, the inspection, the medication rules, all the stuff I went over. But I think growing, quote, mostly organically is a really good thing. The next label is GMO free. And I have to tell you, I struggle with this one personally all the time. I'm an idealistic person. And I realize that we've been genetically modifying plants for thousands of years via selective breeding. But I have a problem with the application of broad spectrum herbicides like Roundup and Roundup Ready crops because they're limiting the diversity of the species that we grow for food and making our food system more fragile because there's less diversity. And they're also having unintended ecological consequences in terms of limiting plant diversity that used to grow as weeds. One notable one is milkweed and its effect on the monarch population. You may say, well, it's just butterflies, but these things have cascading effects across ecosystems. And we really don't know what we're tinkering with in terms of limiting their diversity. So I have a problem with Roundup Ready crops, but at the same time, we're using feed that contains GMO corn and soybeans. So as you can see, I have sort of an ethical dilemma because on one hand, if I bought GMO free grain, again, it would cost two to three times of conventional grain and would limit the access to local food to people that are only more affluent. And I don't want to do that. On the other hand, I don't want to use GMO free grain. So I feel like I'm backed into a corner and that's why I'm always reevaluating it, calling the feed company, asking about the prices of GMO free grain and trying to figure out a way to make it work in our equation. And so far I haven't. The next label is animal welfare approved, which is administered by an organization called the greener world. And I was around when this certification started and at the time, I thought it was a really good idea, and the rules were really simple. The reason that we didn't do it back then was because it required us to raise heritage breed broilers, and we don't. We raise Cornish crosses because that's what the American customer likes in terms of plump birds with lots of white meat. Anyway, when I was preparing for this video, I looked up a Greener World's newer requirements, and holy cow, it looks like one of the code books from when I was an architect, I looked just at poultry and their requirements were, you know, the birds can't gain more than 0.08 pounds per day and you have to have a certified inspector and you have to do this and you have to do that. And my red flag started to go up again, just like with organic certification that, oh my gosh, I'm going to be treated like a child and I've got to follow all these inane requirements and have an inspector come and make sure I did and wow I didn't want any part of that once I looked at it again. I trust the relationship between me and my consumers or my customers and having my customers know that I'm responsible with raising my animals and trusting that relationship rather than them relying on some third party with its strengths and its faults coming in and saying Yep, that guy's okay, you can buy from him. And on the same hand, I also resent it a little bit when a customer will come to my booth at the farmer's market and ask me one question about a label. And whether my answer is yes or no, that's what depends on whether I'm going to get their business or not. They don't care about my farm's history, the intricacies of how we raise our animals, just a label. Are you organic or not? No. Okay, I'm going to the next booth. They're missing out on a wealth of information that distinguishes one farm from another. Now we come to what I think is the ultimate goofiness in labeling, and that's the use of nitrates in bacon. We use sodium nitrite 
to cure bacon. What sodium nitrite does is when you use it to cure meat, again, I'm not a chemist, so I'm giving you my layman's understanding. When you use sodium nitrite to cure meat, sodium nitrite interacts with bacteria on the meat to form nitrates. Those nitrates are lethal to the bacteria which cause spoilage in the meat. So if you cure with nitrite, which turns into nitrates, that, bait, that meat can stay at room temperature without spoiling because of the lethal action on the bad bacteria. Okay, we have that down. Now, in the 90s, when people started focusing on more natural sources for our food and treatments for our food, they developed what's called a natural nitrate that's primarily derived from celery. And this was touted as a healthier alternative to sodium nitrite because there had been links shown to cancer from eating too much sodium nitrite. Now here's the kicker. Whether you're getting your nitrites from sodium nitrite or from celery, it's the same molecule and it causes the same results in terms of any link to cancer as well as how it cures the meat. Furthermore, the FDA regulates how much sodium nitrite can go into curing meats and it requires a certain proportion of antioxidant chemicals in relationship to that to help counteract the carcinogenic effects. But the FDA does not regulate how much celery derived nitrite you put into bacon because it views it as another class of material. So your quote naturally cured bacon can actually be more lethal in terms of nitrites than regular bacon. It makes no sense and it's all a marketing whitewashing campaign for just finding a different way to do the same thing. But as with any risk for a food you eat, these tests that they do are based on these extreme examples. So you picture them testing somebody eating 20 pounds of bacon a day or some crazy amount where the fact is that the salt and the fat would kill them long before the nitrites causing cancer did. So eat bacon, but eat it in moderation. It's the same lesson for any food. I mean, you take these things to extreme, of course it's going to affect your health. I think the real question here is why we're bothering to cure bacon at all anymore. We're not storing it at room temperature. We're freezing it or refrigerating it. We don't need it be to be preserved via curing. My recommendation to people is always, you know, if you want more healthy bacon, put it in the smoker and smoke it yourself. Don't even bother to cure it. If you like the salty taste of bacon, put a rub on it before you smoke it. There's nothing better than home smoked bacon. So I guess I've made my position clear on the use of nitrites. I don't think there's any difference between the marketing ploy of using, quote, natural nitrates versus sodium nitrite, and we sell sodium nitrite containing bacon. The customers have the choice to vote with their feet. They can buy it or they can walk away, but I'm not going to succumb to some marketing campaign that makes people feel good about something that really didn't change. Well, you know, this stuff gets me so worked up, I really didn't get much shop cleaning done, but it looks like I'm going to have a couple more days of nasty weather to get it done anyway. I guess the whole theme here is that you need to put on your grown-up pants when you're a farmer and make decisions for yourself. You can choose to let third-party certifiers into your farm, but to me, whenever you have a big giant set of rules like a code or a checklist, there's going to be cracks that things fall through and because it's made by people, it's not going to be perfect. I would rather use my own head, make the decisions that I need in situ here on my farm rather than somebody off in some other place telling me what I have and what I can't do in terms of making decisions rationally. The other theme here is that unfortunately sometimes you have to walk a line between your ideals and what economic reality is. If I farmed strictly according to my ideals we probably couldn't make a living at it because <laughs> I have some pretty high ideals. And we have to focus on the good. So yes, we use GMO containing feed, but we're also growing animals in such a way that it 
benefits the soil and grows good pasture and sequesters carbon and creates healthier meat for people to eat. So on the balance, we're doing a lot of good here. In the end, every customer has a vote. They can either choose to buy from us or not. And I would rather have the customers that are thoughtful enough to look beyond just a label and to want to get to know their farmer and the intricacies of how they raise their products. Those are the customers I'm looking for and I'm fine if the label shoppers just keep walking. I hope this video is informative. Stay well. Hopefully I'll be back outside next week with more videos about spring on the farm and I'll see you then.